All right, Bruce, come on up. Let's give out our big award. That's a hard act to follow, Hank. I, I, I'm glad he introduced his book the way he did because the next award, while it's actually the Sue Kunitomi Emery Legacy Award, it's also affectionately known as the Baka Guts Award. And we mean to explain that in the program, it actually was a term coined by my uncle Jack Kunitomi, who's over there under a little tent, um, who was here at Manzanar, also at Park Mountain and served in the MIS. It's an award that we give to those unsung heroes, people who are responsible for much, is this on? much of what we see today. What we used to see was simply that monument, some empty fields out here with some broken stone foundations. And now we have a world-class interpretive center run by the National Park Service, led by Les Inifuku, Alisa Lynch, and a number of very capable and extremely hardworking rangers. This award we give out to people who helped this come into being, helped this site be preserved, and helped redress happen. We've given it to important people in the past, the one we're about to give today is to someone who deserves many honors and has received many honors. In the past, last year, we gave this award to Rose Ochi. Rose Ochi served in the Department of Justice and walked the halls of buildings where decisions were made many years ago to lock her and her family up. We gave this award to others who've done outstanding work making redress possible, such as Aiko Herzog Yoshinaga, who as a researcher was responsible for finding out that the government did indeed not share the facts with our courts. And for those accomplishments, we give this award. Warren has a list of accomplishments that I can't even begin to recount. He probably has a list of awards that fill several walls and many desks. He started this in 1969. He's also known me since I was 11 years old, so I have to be very careful what I say about Warren for a tiny. But Warren started this, invited my mother to come back, and in a cold December day, they came back to take care of that monument. And now we have what we have today. So for that, we honor him. He's been responsible for so much he has maintained a clarity, political clarity, a social consciousness with actions to match. This is no armchair activist. This is a man who has done incredible things from the state legislature down to pounding mochi in Little Tokyo. The man has accomplished many things that most of us, well, he's accomplished many things in his life that multiple numbers of people barely accomplish in their lifetimes. So with that, I'd like to introduce Warren Furutani, present Warren with the Sue Kunitomi Emory Legacy Award. Thank you very much, Bruce. It's always a pleasure to be introduced by a friend, if you're being introduced for anything. And Bruce is a longtime friend. I remember for so many years, Bruce and his brother Gary would be doing something. They always had some kind of project whenever we were over at Sue's house organizing this or organizing that. And I just wanted to do a couple of shout outs before I make very short comments. Uh, one of which is that I am a retired legislature, legislator, but a generation before me, I want to honor someone in the front row, uh, Assemblyman retired Paul Badai. Paul was a whole generation before me. Also, just wanted to do a shout out to a lot of the organizations and people I see here that have come from way back in the day. Uh, ADAP, I understand, is here. Is ADAP here? UTLA is in the house. I've seen the red t-shirts. 
And you know, they always get led, and I know he gives his G.O. whatever tour that he gives on the way, but he's my social studies teacher, and that's uh, Mas Fukui. Mas is here as well. Okui, Mas Okui, thank you. But uh, I wanted to thank, just real briefly, also my family for schlepping out here today, getting up real early in the morning, and uh, some of you heard uh, Aiko being introduced, but I'm married to the other Yoshinaga, Abe, and that's her daughter, and that's my partner, Lisa, Abe Furutani. Lisa, where you at? And my two sons, Say and Joey Furutani, and my daughter-in-law, uh, we have Tracy Furutani, and we brought along her mother-in-law, our dear, dear friend, Linda Inoue, for, uh, in Linda Inoue, and also we bought Lisa's aunt. Amy Yoshinaga's in the shade somewhere. She better be in the shade because it's so damn hot. And also a couple of my nephews came, uh, Ryan Kochiyama and Khalil Kochiyama. So we brought the whole crew out here today. But I wanted to just accept this award, and some people have congratulated me, and I appreciate that very much. Uh, several of us here, and I wanted them to stand if you're here, they came on the first pilgrimage. Uh, is anybody here? Is, I know Mo's here. Is Mo here? Because I've heard him complaining already. <laughs> Mo's got to be here. <laughs> Art, I don't know if Art went on the first. Art, are you here? Come on. Is anybody here from the first pilgrimage when we went in December? And that's how much we knew about this. We came on our first pilgrimage in December. It makes no sense at all. No sense at all. Tell the story, Warren. You know, <laughs> and our good friend Brian. I mean, we came in 69, and then we heard through the grapevine, because this is how it was all done. It was done through the, you know, the communication network. It wasn't done through a web page or blog or anything like that. We had heard the two lay ministers, Reverend Wakahiro and Reverend Maeda, were coming back ever since the camp closed. And we came back with them one time, time after, I think it was the second pilgrimage, and that's why we started coming in April. And then I don't know whose idea it was, but somebody had a real great idea thinking that if we do it on opening day for trout season, it's very likely we're going to get the Buddha heads to stop in. So that's why it's the last Saturday of every April. But as you can see in the audience, this has never been just a Japanese-American issue. It's been an issue for all humanity. The issues that are talked about, the issues that are dealt with, whether historically or contemporarily, Bruce and I were talking, and it's a very timely, a very timely time to deal with something like this and the issues involved as we look at what's going on in the country. Some terrible things are happening, but as these terrible things happen, we can't let those be the way and the reason why people start abridging the rights of the Constitution. So it's something you have to be ever vigilant about. But when we came in 69, we really didn't know where we were going. Uh, Victor Shibata and I were going to a rally down in Oceanside, and this gives you another idea that we were just sort of a little off-center, definitely to the left, but off-center. We were going down for an anti-war demonstration in Oceanside right in front of the Marine base. So we were sort of looking for things to happen. And we were talking about we need to march somewhere, damn it. I mean, people were marching to Washington. The farm workers in March to Sacramento. We as Asian Americans need to march somewhere. And so we thought about, we had heard of this place called Mansonau. And so we thought we were going to march from Mansonau, from Little Tokyo. <laughs> then we looked at the map and said, okay, let's go to the end of the San Fernando Valley and then march from there. Then we decided we better come out here, so we came in Victor's raggedy TR4A. It was a Triumph sports car. And we came up 395. We had gotten some orientation from somebody that it was in between Lone Pine and Independence. Ran into Mansonar Road, and we turned right and went east. <laughs> and over there, we ran across all of this asphalt and different roadways, it looked like. And we thought, through our imagination, that this is where the camps must be, and this were the roads. And we were conjuring up all kinds of images, and in the distance, a pickup truck started bouncing toward us in a cloud of dust. And as it got closer, we noticed that there were shotgun rifle racks in the window with guns in them. And as they got closer, we could see they were wearing cowboy hats. And they pulled up on us, and they said, what are you boys doing out here? And as I said, we were a little off-center on the left, 
We didn't, weren't afraid to go to Oceanside to have an anti-war demonstration. We said, we're looking for the camps that <laughs> like you put us in during World War II. <laughs> and they started laughing. And that really got us upset. They were laughing at us. They said, well, if you're looking for Manson on the camp, it's on the other side of 395 to the west. So we had to get in his Triumph sports car and come over here. And we drove on the road that no longer is here as we came because we had heard the camp was one mile wide and one mile deep. And that there was a road from the entranceway one mile north. And we found it, went over the car gate, cow gate, and drove to the west. And tumbleweed and nothing was fixed, everything was overgrown. And as you were going and undulating up and down this dirt road, suddenly we saw the tip of the monument, totally weather-beaten, etc. But as we got closer, it was such a dramatic issue, symbol, and vision. As you could see the monument with the backdrop of the eastern Sierra Nevada mountains. And when we got here, and this is the thing about interpretation, uh, I appreciate the fence around the cemetery, but I still wish we had the barbed wire. That said it all. That said it all. And what we did was we came back here again, cleaned up the monument, and I have to tell you we had this beacon of light that we called upon to interpret the issues. There was no books except for Boswell's America's Concentration Camp. And so we need somebody that was here to interpret what took place. And that was Sue Embry. Sue was a young DSA, you know she was the editor of the Free Press, Manzanar Free Press. I don't know if I should say this, Bruce, but she was a radical, she was a lefty, she was. We work with her issues around anti-war and so many other things besides just Manzanar. But she started filling in all of the empty spaces, all of the questions that we had. And other people, a speaker at our first pilgrimage was Edison Uno, and I don't know if you know Edison Uno, but Edison Uno was from San Francisco. And he was there. And we also had others that came. And people like Amy Uno, Edison Uno, also was an interpreter for us, explaining what really took place, filling in the blanks for us, because we didn't know and there were no books. Bob Nakamura had not done his first film, Manzanar, yet, let alone Tad Nakamura, his film on Manzanar. So all of this was coming together for the pilgrimages. And this became sort of an educational field trip an educational, political, social, political field trip. And I know there's a debate about what terms to use, whether to call it a concentration camp, an internment camp, uh, incarcerated, or intern, whatever terms you want to use. Uh, if you want to know the right terms, just ask Eiko. She'll explain it all to you. <laughs> but we did it first. When we got the first plaque done, we had a limit of number of words that we could put on a bronze plaque. A limit. And we went to the State Historical Society and had a pitch battle on this, on the wording. So before you go, look at the plaque that we set, I think, in the early 70s. It's made in bronze. I don't know if they cleaned it up because people have taken a hatchet to it. They've shot it with weapons and guns. And we say it's a concentration camp, and Japanese were put in here because of economic greed and racism. We got them to put that in bronze. So as we talk about this issue, the concern I have is our interpretation, our continued interpretation. And I appreciate the national parks and all they've done, and I really appreciate the Manzanar Committee, because we need to make sure that the political, social, economic realities of this issue and what the government of the United States did to its citizens throughout this country is the lesson that is always learned. And it's not just a stroll down memory lane. It's a lesson that has contemporary application and it's proven time and time again that we need to be vigilant about making sure that people's constitutional rights are honored no matter the environment, no matter the context, no matter what's going on in the overall society. Those rights are indelible. Those rights cannot be taken from us. I don't care what kind of clothes you wear, what color your skin is, how your eyes look, whatever the case may be. This is something we forever have to be vigilant. I'm honored to receive this award. Thank you very much to the Madsenar Committee and all of you that have come out today. Thank you.
that plaque is as you enter the camp. So it's on, set to the side, and it's in bronze, and it's still there. Thanks again, Warren Fortani, OG. All right. All you folks that are under 30. <laughs> There was a time when you took your life in your hands and you went out on the streets. So turn off the computer and get to work. Put down the iPhone. It's an interesting thing that uh, a quiet generation of people produced people like Warren Furutani or Sue Kunitomi Embry. All right. Did you get some song lyrics in your program? Let's have a group sing-along. Ken Kosho. Kosho-san. Where are you? Kosho san. Ken has driven all the way in from uh, Arizona. You might see him playing down Little Tokyo sometimes. Not too often now, though. And as he sets up here, he's been called the, uh, the Japanese Bob Dylan. I prefer the Japanese Neil Young. He does too. So you might find some song lyrics. You got your song lyrics out. We're going to sing a famous song, which hit number one. How many of you are old enough to remember the 1960s when Q Sakamoto got a number one hit in the United States with a Japanese song? That's pretty amazing. Well, sing along with us. Any Manzanar committee members want to come up like Jonathan? Where are you, Jonathan? Jonathan? Harry, <laughs> Teeny, Mansa Martinar committee members, come on up and sing.
with Sue Cooney, Tony Embry's favorite song. All right, we're going to add something to the program. We're going to have a speaker come up from the Council on American Islamic Relations. Zainab, please, where are you? Please come up, Zainab. Oh, here you are. Welcome. Peace be with you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May the peace and blessings of God be upon all of you here today. Thank you all for having us here. Um, directly after 9 11, the first folks to stand in solidarity with the Muslim American community was the Japanese American community. They understood what it meant to be collectively demonized. Um, and in that struggle and in that experience, stood as partners with the Muslim American community. At that time, our community was fearful. We encountered many parents who discouraged their kids from getting involved with local mosques or their Muslim student associations. We met many Muhammads who changed their names to Mos, many Samers who changed their names to Sam. But it was the strength and solidarity of our allies with us here today that led the way. Together, CARE, Kizuna, the JACL, and NCRR teamed up to create the Bridging Communities Program to educate and empower Muslim American and Japanese American youth and explore the connections between our historical and contemporary struggles and our resilience. With the recent events in Boston, we have seen a similar blowback in public opinion towards the Muslim community and an upsurge in hate incidents. But today, things are different. We are more confident. We are more assured. Fear has subsided because we are blessed with the blossoming friendship of the Japanese American community and the larger interfaith and multicultural communities. I give special thanks to the former internees who are here today who have shared their stories with us. Your resilience is a model and an inspiration to our community. We unite here today to stand together for social justice and our constitutional rights, to celebrate resilience in the face of bigotry and the friendships that reaffirm human dignity and respect. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. You might notice the, uh, the piece that Bruce wrote, the main piece of writing in our program. Why remember? The past revisits us today. The past revisited Boston recently. And as we do learn in the news, if those two guys were not stopped, then the past would have revisited New York City. All right. Let us... Uh, Bring up our keynote speaker, Karen Korematsu. Karen, right on my right here. And I'm just going to look at the first couple sentences of her bio here. She's the daughter of Fred T. Korematsu. And that name, Korematsu, is one of the most famous names from that era. If you studied law, if you've read some history, if you've heard some speakers like a Warren Furitani over the years, you would have heard that name, Korematsu. Karen, please. Good afternoon. Today, we remember. Today, we honor, and today we learn. My first visit to Manzanar was actually in, in the summer of 2011. And when I came here, I could feel that I was on sacred ground. Uh, I've, I visited the, the barracks, and when I walked in there and saw the rope that was strung across the barrack from side to side, indicating where sheets and blankets uh, were hung to uh, designate where the families lived, my heart just sank and I cried because I thought of my grandmother, this lovely Issei woman who came to America in, in, in hopes of it being a better country and a better life for her. And then to have it all stripped away, her possessions being uprooted, 
losing everything and not knowing where she was going and realizing that the conditions here were just deplorable. And in a lot of cases, we treat animals better than we had treated the Japanese and the Japanese Americans at that time. My father's family went to Topaz and he never wanted to go there. Uh, now I understand of the, the pain that he felt at the time. And this is my first pilgrimage and I can tell you this is very inspirational. When my father's uh, Supreme Court case was reopened in 1983, there were many people that did not want him to do so. He had been vilified, actually, since the time he took a stand against the government uh, during the incarceration of 1942. No one wanted anything to do with him. They thought that they, if they associated with my father, that some harm might come to them. And so, basically, our family was ostracized when I was growing up. And I really never knew my, my own community and his, until his case was reopened. And even at that time, he did not have support of some of the people in the redress movement. Because they said, Fred, if you reopen your case, then, then the possibility is that we may not get our apology that we so want. But he really believed that the government was wrong and he was right. And so when his conviction was overturned in 1983, it set the precedent for the redress and reparations in the, in the 1988 Civil Liberties Act that was signed by President Reagan. And actually my parents went to Washington, D.C. to help lobby for, for this apology because after all, that's all anyone really wanted. It wasn't about the money. It was to have the government say they were wrong and, and hopefully for them to learn the lessons of history. In, in 1998, my father received the Presidential Medal of Freedom, which is the highest civilian honor you can receive in this country. But when he did, he did so on behalf of all Japanese and Japanese Americans that had been incarcerated. He had continued to speak out and crisscross this country and educate about what had happened here and in the other nine concentration camps where people were incarcerated and the, and the injustices that were dealt with at the time. It was, it was very moving for him to receive this honor. And even though there were some people in his own community that didn't think that he deserved it. It's really fitting, I think, that former Assemblyman Warren Futani is being honored today because it was of his efforts uh, to author the bill along with now Senator um, Block to establish Fred Korematsu Day of Civil Liberties and the Constitution in perpetuity for the state of California. And now we celebrate that on my father's birthday of January 30th. But the point being is an opportunity for education. And so through my institute that I've co-founded, we have established uh, teaching curriculum from kindergarten through 12th grade that now we send out to teachers for free. So teachers can go to www.koromatsuinstitute.org and order teaching kits because after all, we need to continue education. It's amazing to me how still to this day, especially when I go to the East Coast, people really don't know anything about the Japanese American internment. They don't know how horrible it was at, this, at that time. And so, obviously, we still have a lot of work to do. After 9-11, soon after 9-11, 2001, when my father's Supreme Court case was being brought up again by the Bush administration as a reason to round up Arab and Muslim Americans and put them in American concentration camps. It was my father and the Japanese American Citizens League who stood up and said, no, you cannot do this. We need to remember our history. But how, how much have we learned? Because now we have the National Defense Authorization Act. And in case you don't know, it still threatens our civil rights. So over 70 years later, how far have we come? That's the question. 
Now, Senator Feinstein last year tried to introduce an amendment that would protect our rights as American citizens and those who were here illegally as immigrants. Unfortunately, it didn't go far enough to, to also protect our undocumented um, citizens. But she tried to make the effort, and there was a hearing in Washington, D.C., and I even submitted um, a, a document you know, to her judicial co committee to say that we at least need to protect our civil rights. So at the end of last year, through the Joint Congressional Reconstruction Committee, they threw out her amendment. So listen up. We have no protection against our civil rights, for our civil rights. They're still being threatened, and we have a lot of work to do. Uh, and so I charge you, when you go here from today, to tell what happened here, tell people what you've learned, and also to share your own stories. Tell your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren, and send out emails, blogs, and even write that old-fashioned letter because we still need to educate. Otherwise, something that will happen like the Japanese-American internment will happen again. And so please remember my father's words. When you see something wrong, don't be afraid to speak up. Thank you. Karen Korematsu, ladies and gentlemen. For you younger people, there is history all around you.